Hello and welcome back to another instructional video. I'm very excited to be talking about this game today. It's another Christian Marcuson game. I've obviously already done the Merchants and Marauders video and it's one of my favourite games. So I was really, really excited to get this one. It's only just arrived to UK shores but um, it is in your shops if you are looking to buy it. And it's a really fun game. Maybe there's a few bits which could uh, be house ruled depending on how much you like luck and stuff in games. So, without further ado, let's set up the board and have a look at how a turn plays out. Okay, so here we have the board set up for a two-player game. I haven't bothered with a second-player player board, simply on the basis that we're not going to be playing a full game out. The map is set up based on uh, the number of players, so you can just look in the rule book and you get a very clear guide on how to set the map up. The starting tiles, uh, for this game the mountains need to be opposite, they're double sided, so uh, just make sure you put them in the right place, I don't think it makes a big difference. And then you put one settlement and one settler on the fertile space. Okay. So that's the starting board, very very simple to set up. You've got some cards here, some event cards, action cards and objective cards. And indeed, at the start of the game, you will take one action and one objective card. Now one of the things that my friends and I have started to house rule, and I definitely play it normally first, but see how you go with it, is to take three action and three objective cards and draft two of them. So it gives you a bit more of an advantage at the start and then in the very last round you're not going to take an action and an objective card. So as we go through the rules you'll find that you get to draw more and more of these cards after each sort of round if you like. So we're just sort of speeding it up and we're foregoing the action and objective in the last round. Gives you maybe a little bit of a better idea on how to advance and where to advance. The event cards won't come out for ages and the wonder cards, the red cards in the top uh, right hand corner, uh, won't come out for a long time either. So then we get down to our individual player boards. Now this is where the meat of the game lies. So let's zoom in a little bit because there's a little bit we need to set up here. First up you can see our resource tracker. I apologise for my voice, I've kind of got a cold at the moment. This monitors how many of each resource you have and you can see we start the game with two food. You'll also notice that there is actually a limit of the amount of food you can get so this reads food limit until the storage advance is acquired. So every other thing is unlimited or up to eight because that's as far as the track goes but food is capped at two unless you research a specific tech. The candle is ideas the stone is ore, the woods are for uh, well the wood is wood, and the gold, and that's a gold piece, is gold. The other two markers are your cultural maximum and your happiness maximum. So at the start of the game, you will not be allowed to have any happiness or any culture. As you research technologies, you will move up in happiness, and then you will take a happiness um, resource which is one of these smiley faces, but instead of putting it on here, this just monitors how many maximum happiness you are. On your little cheat sheet or player aid, you would put your happiness into a pool there. So that would be where you would store your happiness and your culture, or your mood and your culture. Um, this would just track your uh, maximum limits. When you hit three, five and seven, you'll draw an event which can be good or could be bad depending on what's happened in them. The starting texts you begin with are farming which lets you harvest from basically fertile spaces and mining uh, which lets you harvest ore from mountains. So farming actually lets you harvest wood from wood spaces and food from fertile spaces and mining lets you harvest ore. And in reality, that is the, the setup of the, uh, of the game. You've got two food, you've got these two texts. You will also have these action and objective cards. 
So my objective card is um, twofold. So let's just well, let's just move this into the middle, and you can get a better look. Hopefully, there we go. So my objective card is twofold. So let's just read what an objective is, and uh, then we will go through that, and, and we'll also go through an action card as well. So this is the objective. Every objective is worth two victory points. You will get one at the end of every round, and a round consists of three turns. So every three turns, you're going to get another objective. There is one technology which lets you draw a, a further one, uh, but you're going to have about six in the total uh, sort of life of the game. The top half of the objective card is generally seen as the peaceful route. So this is government. I have to have all four advances in any one government. So you can actually see, cunningly, to my, uh, to my right, we have autocracy. That means I have to have four cubes in all of these things in order to uh, be able to get that objective. Alternatively, a aggressor card. Uh, this The bottom half is the aggressive one, so the nasty one. Immediately after eliminating at least two army units in a battle, you started against another player. So, I can either get this at the end of a round, okay, in the status phase. I'll declare that I have got all four techs in the government. Or this immediately when I actually um, eliminate two armies. And that will sit there and be a hidden objective for me. And the reason I like drawing two is it just gives you a bit of a better idea. The action cards, again, are twofold. This one's a really good action. So it's called Advance. You'll see it costs a culture to play. So some of the more powerful ones do cost culture. So you're going to have to research technologies which give you culture in order to get that. As a free action, gain and advance at no food cost. So effectively, by paying one culture, this is a free research action. So it gives me four actions in one particular turn. Once I've used it, the guard is discarded from the game. The bottom half of the action cards are tactic cards. Now you can only use these if you've researched tactics. And they basically help you fighting other players or barbarians. So, Peltasts. Prior to a combat roll, roll a dice for each of your army units. If you roll at least one hit, you may cancel one of your opponent's hits. So, the guy comes along with three guys, thinking he's going to kill me. I can actually uh, deal with that by playing this Peltast card and block one of his hits for the first round of combat. So I don't find that the tactics cards are really that useful. There's the odd one which makes a big difference, but on the whole, you would never want to give that up for the free action that you get. So you start the game with these two cards, and that is effectively it. We've started with our technology, we have our two food, and we can move into the game proper. So what can you do on a turn? Well, let's go through the, uh, the different actions in order. We've got this snazzy map, but unfortunately our fir first action will be using the player board itself. So the first action we can do is we can advance a technology. That will cost us two food, so it would move us all the way down to zero. And then we would be allowed to research a new technology. Now, there is so many different technologies here. That, that would be a whole video in its own right, which I might do later on, just giving people a good intro to what the game is. So you've got all of these technologies. There are a few rules about what we can research. When we're going into a new tech, so maritime would be a new type of tech, you always have to research the top one first. There is no choice there. You have to research the top one. If we have moved into that one, so we're already in agriculture with our farming, we can actually move into any of these and research any at that point. We had to have farming, but after that we didn't need anything else. There are a few exceptions to this, so construction's a nice example. Construction, we have our first one, which is mining, but then we have engineering and sanitation and roads. I hope you can see this, but it says engineering 
as a prerequisite for sanitation and roads. So if I wanted to research roads, I would actually have to research engineering first. So generally, we're going to uh, be starting off on a new thing. The top one of these four also let us build the corresponding building in our city. So maritime lets us build a port, uh, education an academy, warfare a fortress, and spirituality a temple. If the, the final research um, that's worth mentioning is you'll notice that there are these three arrows here. So you've got philosophy, which will in turn lead to democracy. So I cannot research democracy until I have put one cube in philosophy, and then I will be able to research democracy, and then I can research any of the others. So to get to a government tech, you will actually have had to have made three separate research actions. One to begin the tree, one for the bottom one, and then one going into the relevant government. So the first thing I'll do is research, I don't know, let's say I research fishing. So that means it's cost me the two food to do that and then it has got a yellow border. So because it's got a yellow border that means that my culture is becoming more happy because they get to eat sushi or something like that. So the yellow border will correspond with an increase in the maximum happiness your city can have. You'll notice there are blue bordered ones which would of course have an increase in the maximum of culture you can have. So because I've moved up on this track, whenever you research a happy tech, you'll be able to go over to your pool and put one happiness in there. So that's the first type of action, the advance. There are so many techs here, this is going to be the one which causes analysis paralysis. So be aware that that is one of the harder things to agonise over what you want, and it can be quite important. If you research the wrong thing at the wrong time, that can really cripple you later on in the game. Okay, the next action is to found a city. Now at this point in time, I would not be able to found a city, but if my settler was in an empty space, I could, for an action, turn him into a city. And that's really it. So it costs an action, and you lose your settler, and then you have founded a city. The next action is to activate the city. So I choose a city on the board, this one, and I can do three things. But I can only do one of the three things with each activation. I could build units. Now units will cost two food if I want to build a settler, or an ore and a food if I want to build a, um army, or two wood if I wanted to build a ship. So, I could build units. Now, one of the really important things in the game is that city size will mean or affect how much of a, um, an action you can do. So, at the moment, this is a one-piece city. It's a size one city, so it would only be able to build one unit. If, because I just researched ports, now I couldn't do this. I need to be next to the sea to have a port, but let's say that this was by the sea. If I research ports like so, it's now got two bits to it, so it's a size two city. So now it would be able to build two units, providing I had the resources. So, first thing is build units. The second thing we can do with a city is collect resources. And again, you collect based on the size of the city. So this is a size one city. It would only be able to collect one resource. So I could get food from this space. I could get ore from this space and I could get wood from this space. So I get one of those things. I cannot get anything from the desert space unless I research irrigation, which is one of the technologies in the, um, in the technology tree. So first we can build up to the number of uh, the size of the city, a number of units up to that. Then we can collect resources. It's one or the other, remember. You don't get to do both. Uh, that would be two separate actions. And finally, we could increase city size. So that is when we make the city bigger, 
and it costs one food, one wood, and one ore. This is a NAF example, I apologise, this is a port. You have to build it with an adjacent sea space. You cannot build it like this. Uh, but that's just because we research fishing, so that's why I'm doing it. So that would be um, your third thing you could do if you activated a city. One really important thing is if you have a really big juicy city, say I have a, a size 5 city, and I can um, collect five resources from it. Okay, that's brilliant. I get five resources. And then I want to build five units from the same city. If you activate the city twice, it goes down in happiness. If you've activated it three times, it goes down twice in happiness. So if it was a size five happy city, it would become a size five neutral city. If it was already neutral, it would become unhappy, which is really bad, because an unhappy city is always treated as size 1. So every single action after that would only be able to collect one resource or build one unit. So you definitely need more than one city uh, in order to, uh, to grow <laughs> and to be able to actually do things. So that's the activate city action. Each one, each part of that, costs an action. So collecting resources would cost me one action, building some resources would cost me a second action, and then building, uh, increasing the size of the city would cost me my third action, and that would be the end of the round. The next one is move. So you can move three units, one space, or three groups of units, one space. Now we only have one unit on the board, so I'm just gonna put some pretend units on here. Okay, I'm not allowed to be, uh, move one unit many spaces. So, I do a move action. That lets me move three groups of units, one space each. So he will move into that space. And it's important we say and declare where we're moving into. We'll flip this tile over. Now, in theory, you would be able to rotate it how you see fit. But there are some really important rules. You cannot drown yourself, so I cannot put it there. That would be impossible. The sea space has to touch the edge of the map unless uh, any of the other rules are broken. So obviously I can't drown myself to make the sea space touch the edge of the map, but in this case I want it to be at the edge of the map, and he has moved into there. This guy, for the same move, it's all one action, three units can move three spaces, I explore there and I can now choose. I can either choose to have it this way with a desert space or I can choose to have it this way with mountains. Now mountains are interesting. If you go into mountains you can never move that army again until your next um, until your next turn. So say this was the first action I did on my turn and I'll move him into here because I've got three actions, let's say. So I move him into here. I cannot drown myself, so I have to move into here. So I move my settler in there. Now say for my next action I wanted to move again. You are not allowed to move people that have moved into mountains a second time, even though you have spent a second action. So if I did another move, all I would be able to do is move that one into there because these guys are lost in the mountains. So mountains stop movement. If you move into a forest, then you cannot attack in subsequent moves. So I can't move one and then attack. That would be impossible. So whilst this is a pretty shitty city in some respects, in that it's only got one food space and one wood space, it's got this ridge of mountains protecting it, which means it will be much harder for an enemy to um, sneak up on me and kill me. There are ways around it, but on the whole, it will be very difficult for them to attack me. So that is the move action. The next action is called um, civic improvement. This is quite an odd one. You'll remember earlier in my we got uh, one of these happiness tokens. So, this is where you spend your happiness. You take the number of tokens equal to the size of your city. So this is a size one city, so I need one token. 
If it was a size 5 city, I would need 5 tokens. And for that number of tokens, you can then make one city happy. You can shift a city from being unhappy to happy for one action, provided you have enough happiness. So it actually cost me one happiness to reduce it to zero, and then a second happiness to make the city happy. Why would you want to do that? When you have a happy city, it counts as one bigger than it is currently. So now this is regarded as a size 2 city, even though it is actually only size 1. So now it could collect from two spaces, or it could um, build two units. Remember, if I collected from two spaces and then proceeded to build two units, because I've activated it twice, it's no longer happy, but that is how you would do it. Cultural influence is the very last action and will not see play right until the end of the game. When you have built up your cities somewhat, okay, so you've got some pieces on your cities, and let's just dummy this up a little bit. Ooh, I don't know what this tile's going to look like. So this tile has to go here because C has to go next to C. So let's say I've managed to get right next to this city and I have my lovely city there. I'm going to stick an army in it because we don't want him to attack us. So over here we have a size 2 city. For cultural influence, what you can do is you can try and influence a city that is the number of hexes away equal to the size of your city. So I can actually influence a city that's all the way over here, two hexes, size two, and I can influence this city. What that actually means is I roll the dice. Okay, I roll the dice, I've got a four. On a five or more, I can turn one of their pieces into my color. Now I only rolled a four, I can actually spend a culture token to increase the range or the roll, both uh, the range and the roll. So here I'm within range, it's a size two, but if it was not, if it was a size one, I'd have had to have spent one culture increasing the range, because I can only influence one hex away with this city. So I spend one culture to increase the range to two. And then I can spend a second culture to increase my four to a five. And you need a five or a six to actually turn one piece into a uh, into your color. Now all that means for the mechanics of the game is that at the end of the game you get an extra victory point and your neighbour gets one less victory point. So it's net of positive two. Um, it doesn't mean that that's your temple at all. It just means it's architecturally inspired by you. So that's the last action that you have, which is cultural influence. The only thing I haven't dealt with is attacking, and I'll just do that ever so quickly. So attacking uh, is part of the move action. So we've got some guys here, and we've got one guy here. Uh, to move your armies, you actually need a technology called tactics. Uh, but you need that to play cards as tactics anyway. What you would do is you would move into this space for one move action. Actually, that's a bad example because I can't attack there because I've... Uh, move through a forest so this guy he's got a death wish and he moves into there the green player will roll one dice because he has that many people the yellow player will roll two dice because he has that many people before you roll dice you will declare if you're going to use a tactic card neither of them are so the green guy rolls a dice and he rolls a one the yellow dice rolls a dice and he rolls a nine you divide the number you've rolled by 5, and that's how many hits you've got. So green has scored no hits, because 1 divided by 5 is a decimal place. Yellow has scored 1 hit. Even though he's got 9, he only has got 1 hit. And green's guy has died. And that's really it. Uh, there are other things like fortresses. When you upgrade a city size, um, you, will, uh, you will begin to uh, cancel hits. You get extra dice and stuff like that but on the whole that is combat so that's the overview of the rules we will do a quick dummy couple of turns i'll just show you how it goes up to the first status phase which hopefully will give people a little bit of an idea on how the game progresses
So let's go through a couple of example turns. Um, I'm going to play it just as one player, so we'll ignore the blue player. They'd obviously have their goes. So it's turn one. I get three actions on my first turn. And there is a very standard opening move, but it's a very strong opening move. So you can't really argue with it. So I get three things to do. Remember I started the game with two resources, two food, and these two technologies. So the very first thing I'm going to do is research irrigation. Now irrigation is really good for two reasons. First up, it gives me a free happiness. Uh, well, three reasons. It gives me a free happiness, which is really handy, so I can move up on the happiness track. So if I just move up, i show you I'm on one happiness now. It also means I can collect from the desert. So that means I don't have to worry about desert anymore. And certain events are called fam um, will come out, there'll be famines. And if you've got irrigation, it doesn't affect you. And there's quite a few famines in the deck. So there's lots of reasons to get that tech. That's going to cost me my two food. So that's my very first action. I get a free bump on happiness. I get one in my happiness pool. And I have now got a new technology. My second action will be to do that civic improvement. I currently have a size one city, so it's going to cost me one happiness to make that city happy. And now for building and collection, it's deemed to be two, um, two happiness rather than one. That was my second action. I have a third action, and then I will activate this city, and I will collect. So I can choose to get an ore, a wood, a food, and a food. So I can get two of them because it's one bigger than it should be. So I'm immediately going to get two food. So all I've done in my first go is I've managed to maintain my level of resources, get a free technology essentially in the irrigation, and make my city happy. And if you are playing out for the first time, there's no shame in doing that as a move. I think it's a very strong opening move. It's very hard to go wrong this early on in the game. So that's the very first go. Now Blue would have his three turns. And then we will move the turn marker on to round two, or turn two, I suppose I should say. So it's now turn two of round one, and we get three more actions. Now for my second go, remember I've actually got two food at this point. Okay, so I've got two food sitting down here. My first action is going to be to activate this city again. Now, the activation, the multiple activation, is on each turn. So this is the first time I have activated this city uh, this turn. And I'm going to spend two food for a settler. Now, one of the important things I didn't mention, which is very important in the game, is we've already said that as time goes by, you're going to upgrade your cities. You can only upgrade them equal to the number of, build, um, of settlements you have on the board. So I only have one settlement, so I actually can't improve it. It's only when I get my second settlement that I'll be able to make my first and my second one level two. I can only upgrade it at the point where I have two. So you need five settlements out to get all of the upgrades out, because the middle piece counts as a piece as well. So my first action was to activate the city. My second action is going to be to move, and I'm going to move here and here. Remember, you can only move one uh, space with a move action, but you can move up to three units. I do not have three units, but I can move two, so that's what I can do there. So, I flip this over. Remember, I can't drown myself. Now, water has to be near the sea, uh, near, near the side of the board, but in this case, Water is near the side of the board in both scenarios. Um, it doesn't make a big difference really, so I'll move to there. This guy, we flip it over, and we found a lovely uh, fertile space, which is nice for this city. You'll notice by exploring, we've now opened up a lot more spaces for this city to collect. So that was my second action. I have no food. If I collect from this space, because I've already activated it, they're going to be grumpy. So I can't really do that. So for my third action, I'm going to move again. Unfortunately, this guy moved into mountains. So he won't be able to move, because when you move into mountains, you cannot move again. So this guy's going to move up here, 
and we'll see what spawns here. Okay, so you'll notice I kind of just killed myself there. We can't kill ourselves. And it, even with that, you actually have to place water next to water. Okay, so I couldn't kill myself, but if possible, I'll place water next to water anyway. Now, whenever you see two fertile spaces on a piece of terrain, you'll notice there's that barbarian symbol there. So that means we have to spawn barbarians in one of the fertile spaces. So I'm going to have to put one barbarian unit and one barbarian city there. Now people see that this is an, a really bad thing, early game. It's not. It fundamentally isn't. I disagree with that, absolutely. Barbarians only attack you when you trigger certain events. So you can dictate when barbarians attack you. Barbarian attacks are not that damaging. They don't take over your city, they just make your city upset. Okay? And if you kill a barbarian, you get a gold for every unit you kill, which is nice. You can keep the city or get another gold, which is nice. Gold is a wild resource. You can use it as anything except for culture and happiness. So you can get loads of free resources. It's really not a bad thing. Okay, so we've, we've spawned our first barbarian. I think that's actually quite tasty. This uh, city is not going to be able to make a port. This can never become a size 5 city because it doesn't have water adjacent to it. So that is the end of our second go. We're already coming up to the end of the first uh, round. So it's round 3 now, or turn 3 now, of round 1. And we have 3 more actions. The first thing we will do is collect two food from this city down here. So I collect two food from that city. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a technology for my second action. And let's get something exciting. Uh, let's get tactics. So given that we've just got our first aggressor out, tactics is a good idea. What does tactics let us do? Well. It lets us move our armies. So we're allowed to build armies before tactics, but we cannot move them. So um, we can also use the action at the bottom of the action card, Pell Tests, if we wanted to. You'll notice it's got a blue border, so we increase our culture by one, and then we move our culture pool, and we put a culture token in the pool. So, we've got one culture, and that was our second action. Now, this is cool for us, because what it lets us do is we had this special card at the start. Remember, everyone gets them. Pay one culture to play, and as a free action, get an advance at no cost. So, I get to pay my culture, which I just got for tactics, and then as a free action, I get a, um, a free advance. Now I'll tell you now, this is my all-time favourite strategy at the moment. Uh, originally I went for democracy, I'm going to digress a little bit here. Democracy is very powerful, it has this economic liberty thing, which essentially gives you a fourth action, because it gives you a free collect action, but it makes every other collect action very expensive. Don't do that. Go warfare, it's much more sensible and it protects you quite well. We're going to go for draft. So draft... Bumps us up on culture again, which was free, remember, because we uh, we um, we paid that culture to take that free action. And it lets us pay one mood to build an army, which is really good. <laughs> you probably don't know that yet, but it's really good. So draft is very strong. So we've got that. We've got our extra culture. You'll notice that our... Um, our culture is now at two. If we get another cultural advance, we're going to be uh, hosed. We're going to get an event, which could be a bad thing. So let's leave that. We don't want to trigger an attack yet. So that was still all part of our second action. Those two research actions were, were one action, effectively. And then for my third action, I'm going to build a city. So I get to build a city, and that is going to go there. Okay. And now I've got two cities on the board, so now I could, later on in the game, 
upgrade one of those cities to have an extra thing or both of those cities so now if I can get fishing out I could upgrade it and then I've got a port there and that would be really nice so that's the end of round three and then we move on to the status phase which I deliberately have left till the end so we move up to there and we go through some certain things so as we just focus on this it's a bit of a funny angle I apologize First up, we look at our objective cards and have we completed any of them. Well, we are way off the of government and we are not attacking any players yet. So we have not completed our objective cards. Then we receive a free advance. The first player will take an advance and then the second player and so on will take an advance. But it is done in turn order and that's quite an important thing. So we get to research one of these things for free. Okay. So, I get to research something for free. Given that I've just gone next to a sea space, I'll get fishing. Fishing lets me build the port, which is nice. And it also lets me collect one food from a sea space. If I build a port, I can turn that food into a happiness or a gold. I can get one happiness or gold a turn. And you'll remember, my draft lets me build units for one happiness. So, it synergizes very well. It's got a yellow border, so that's going to bump me up on happiness again. And then I'll go to my little pool of happiness, and I'll put one happiness in there. So that was the next one. We then draw cards. So we get one more action and one more objective. So let's have a look at what we've got. Okay, so we go down to our objective and action cards. Mass collection. You can collect two more resources than usual. That's insanely good. Okay. And sea lanes, two or more trade routes. So I need to research in economics and get some trade routes. That's going to be really hard. Draconian uh, have four or more angry cities. That's a bit of a weird one. Why is that seen as the aggressor? When you take over another player's city, they immediately become angry. So, we get our objectives, you do that after your text, and that's really important. Because uh, you'll remember, one of my objectives was to get uh, all of the government advances of one particular thing. So it might be, if I look at the objective first, I, I choose a tech because of the objective I've just got, and of course that's kind of cheating. Then we look, we can turn one city, a size one city, we can raise it to the ground for one gold if we wanted to. Generally that's a defensive measure. If they've built a massive army up and they look like they're going to take you, you might as well burn your city down and prevent them from, uh, your enemy from attacking you. And then we determine first player. First player is chosen by the person with the most combined maximum culture and happiness. So I have a maximum culture of two, and uh, happiness of two, and culture of two for four. So I have four, my neighbour, say, has three. I would then be able to choose whether I go first or last. There's not a huge difference. Some of the events will be bad. That's, the, in essence, the game. The only thing I haven't shown you is the event. So say, uh, rather than taking uh, fishing, I took, I don't know, writing. That would have bumped me up to um, the events. Now the events are so bad, I personally would opt that you can either take one or not. If you choose to take, I mean the rule states you just take one, but let's have a look. So this one isn't actually that bad, but we'll see what it means. Great Merchant, this is the only reason you might want to be first player in a turn, is that you get first access to all of these ones which pop over the status phase. So pay one culture and as an action, that's what AAA stands for. You get a free advance in economics and you can get money from trade routes. Not that good, but still, one culture to get free research and potentially some money if you've got trade routes. Depending, It's very dependent on the player. Importantly, you've got this symbol here. Uh, this is barbarians will spawn. So we get another barbarian tribe out. If it's got a little sword there, it means barbarians attack. If it's a gold symbol, it normally means that those cards are really bad for you, but it means you get two gold. So we have to spawn barbarians. You do that by taking uh, one barbarian city and one barbarian uh, uh, person and place it on any space which is valid, which is everywhere but a desert. So I can put it there. That would be my 
spawning barbarians, you also then get a second army to place on any one barbarian city. So the barbarians are coming for me. It's lucky I got draft. Uh, we'd have to see a few more rounds to see if I defeat them. So that's Clash of Cultures. It's a very good game. It's quite frustrating at times if you get a bad event or if your friend gets... The first time you played it properly, uh, one of our friends was always first player and got four great people out, um, which was a bit OTT. And his action cards were much better than everyone else's. Uh, but with this drafting mechanic we started playing with, that has minimised that uh, flaw, if you like. It's a very fun game. Um, I may well do another video highlighting the different advances that you can get. One thing I would say is do not neglect armies. If you do, if you neglect armies, A, quite a lot of your objectives will become that much harder to complete. And B, you will make yourself a target. Uh, I've played five games now. And of three of them, they ended early because one player was completely wiped out. Which isn't much fun for that player. So please don't neglect your armies. You do need them. Uh, so that's quite important. But it's very good. I would argue it's more enjoyable, believe it or not, as a two-player game. Because there is less king-making. In the three-player game we played last night, uh, the person who stayed out of battles won. Uh, because the other two were just bashing heads. And they wasted a lot of actions doing that. But it was still fun. Uh, so that's ultimately all I judge a great game on. So hopefully this cleared up a few of the rules. I'm certain I got some wrong. So there will be people posting underneath this where I went wrong. Uh, enjoy Clash of Cultures. It's really, really good. Uh, well played, Christian. You've done another one. Uh, I want to know when your next uh, great game is coming out.